think people are lazy. I mean, to know something about the law takes a lot of sort of reading boring, uh, you know, a lot of boring material and knowing a lot about history, right? It's so e much easier to say this person thought this thing and now everyone just, you know, Marx or Foucault is like pulling the strings and making every liberal act like the way they do, right? Um, I, you know, I think, I think it is just sort of like an intellectual laziness, um, which is why, you know, which is why like the, the legal or bureaucratic or institutional focus. I mean, I think, I think I make a very strong case. I think the evidence is there. Um, it's not something that's sort of like, uh, you know, it's been hidden or anything. It's just like you have to read a lot of books and a lot of articles and sort of a lot of legal documents in order to put the story together. Welcome to the New Flesh Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Ricky Allpike and joining me once again is Jonathan Astro. John, we're currently in the midst of some turmoil worldwide where Israel is in a bad spot here with Hamas invading recently. Mm. Uh, what do you make of it all? Oh, God. This is... You've jumped me. This is a heavy <laughs> topic and very complex and I know nothing about it. Thank you. Uh, but I've got the courage to say that I know nothing about it and I, and I want to. <laughs> well, I, I'm not quite sure when this episode is going to air, so perhaps in the next few weeks we might be in World War Three. I'm not sure. So if that happens... I, you know, good luck to you, sir. I hope you do well. Yeah. But what I found interesting was, is that you can misgender someone in 2023 and be called a Nazi, yes. but then you can go on the steps of the Sydney Opera House mm. and chant gas the Jews. And you can be held up as, you know, by the left as, you know, freedom fighters. Mm. Thanks, for, thanks for saying that. That's really, it's really going to get this episode, uh, <laughs> You know, you know, it's really going to uh, delight the algorithm. Those well, words. the the topsy turvy nature of the world we're living in right now does have it does have a history and does have an origin, and we're going to be talking about that today. Yes, we're going to be talking about that uh, uh, with Richard Hanania about his book, The Origins of Woke. But you know, something in uh, interesting came out of our discussion, Ricky. We get a lot of people asking us about the name of the podcast, and you know, uh, where does that come from? What does it mean? He seemed to suggest somewhat half-jokingly that he asked if it was a gay podcast. So, like, is it... Do people think... Not that there's anything wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But, but do people think that, it's a, that we're sort of, like, based gay conservatives? I'm not sure. We do talk about, about our wives a lot, so... Yeah, but they're, you know... And our kids. Beards, oh, they're just beards. <laughs> they're just beards. And then this is the real action right uh, here. Oh, yeah. They see that's they they don't tune in, so they don't know what happens on the podcast. No, no they don't. <laughs> We're like British MPs hiding our yes. proclivities. Yes. yes. Well, we are recording this uh, in our panties right now. So, oh, don't, don't <laughs> you know? Uh, stop revealing behind the curtain. Come with the show. Uh, well, we need your help here at The New Flesh. We need you to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to the show. Please follow us on X and Instagram. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment about the show you liked or perhaps one that you didn't. Also, word of mouth is a very powerful tool, so please tell all of your friends. And finally, to our Uber fans, if you love what we do, you can send us a little cash via the Buy Me A Coffee platform. Any donation here is very much appreciated. And now, on with the show. Richard Hanania is a research fellow at the University of Texas and the president and founder at the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology. He was previously a research fellow at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia University. He is also the author of Public Choice Theory and the Illusion of Grand Strategy. His most recent book is The Origins of Woke, Civil Rights Law, Corporate America and the Triumph of Identity Politics. Saga and Jetty from Breaking Point says, to understand the cultural revolution sweeping the US and how to fight it, you must read this book it's as simple as that close quote the atlantic dubs it a trojan horse for white supremacy uh, richard welcome to the new flesh thanks thanks glad to be here i'm not at the university of texas anymore but besides that the uh uh the uh intro was perfect you know i knew that that was gonna that was gonna, gonna be the case so many apologies no it's not because of that it's just because i just it ended i had a fellowship and it ended in the summer of uh 2023 oh so, so. we weren't kicked out uh uh you <laughs> no, dishonorably no, no. discharged yes no, <laughs> never happened to me, no. Well, we're going to get into your, bo your book shortly, The Origins of Woke. Uh, we also have some questions about um, cancellation, along with uh, some of the uh, some questions about the delicious hit pieces that have been penned about you. Uh, I have to say, though, Richard, I discovered uh, recently that you have some some Arab roots, if if I am correct. 
Um, yeah, I'm, I'm full. I'm full Arab. I uh, well, 23 and me. I just I posted it uh, not a couple of weeks ago. It's okay, like 80 percent and yeah, 20 percent European or something. Full like Arab certified. Um, so, were you never tempted to whip this out as a woke jitsu move on your critics? I mean, shouldn't HuffPo and the Atlantic face up to their hate crimes against you? Hashtag I stand with Hanania. No, in America, I mean, Arabs are pretty much considered white. I mean, it's pretty much how you look. I know they're considered Asians, and I don't know about Australia, but I know in the UK they go to the Asian category, which is not how it works in the United States. And then just because of my looks, I have nothing. I saw Bukele the other day saying, as a Palestinian, this is what I think about the Israeli-Hamas uh, war. And I was like, oh, I never, you know, Bukele does it. He's very politically incorrect. Maybe I can do it too. Um, but, I, but, you know, I, I don't like identity politics, so, so I tend not to do that. Uh, you're a very principled man. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it makes me cringe. I hate, I just hate it. I hate it. I hate it everyone who does this you're, you, uh, but you're not the passion. first of our guests to to everyone we ask jason hill everyone we've yeah, said, hill. we ask everyone we say come they've all got something they can use and none of you use it and and everyone can use something because anything besides heterosexual white males says right that's like not a huge part of the population anymore in the u.s mm. um and so yeah everyone's got something well, John, don't you don't you have a distant, distant, yes. like Indian? My great, like, like my great, great, great uncle or something, great grandfather uh, uh, was in uh, British India, and he married a young bride. Unfortunately, it appears that he was a minor attracted person. <laughs> but that was the times, I believe. Uh, you know, uh, she was uh, quite young. Uh, but yeah, so I'm going to ride that wave. What do you think, Richard? How, can, New, New, New Flesh is not a gay podcast. <laughs> I, assume. That's, I assume that's what it was. <laughs> uh, it could be. I mean, you know, we're, we're open. Uh, so anyway. Well, well, John, I am buying you a turban for your birthday. Okay? Yes, well, well, I'll wear it. One of the recent threads on on this show has been cancellation, uh, which and we just happen to have interviewed several outspoken people recently who have been cancelled in in various ways, and you wrote a piece on your Substack recently about cancellation. So, what are your thoughts on cancel culture? Uh, is it as bad as it once was? I uh, you know I, I had that piece and it was very American centric. Uh, you know, like the culture follows sort of America, but I think it's a very, very unique to the American political situation. So my article was, and uh, yeah, I think it, I think it is. I think there was like uh, among conservatives, there were gatekeepers about, you know, 12, 15 years ago where there really wasn't that much media. There wasn't much you could do at your own. If you wanted to be a conservative writer or columnist, you can go on Fox news. You can write for the New York post or national review. There's only a handful of things. And those, and the people who ran those uh, tended to be pretty, you know, establishment to, you know, had good relations with sort of the liberal media. It's like Mitt Romney style Republican. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mitt Romney, Bush, McCain. Um, and, you know, like anyone who was sort of, you know, deviated from like a line in a lot of ways, like anyone who was sort of who was anti-war or someone who was like skeptical of uh, American foreign policy um, really wasn't allowed. Anyone who was considered, quote unquote, too racist um, or too sexist, um, homophobic didn't really exist yet. But, you know, it was coming later. Um, and that was just the way it was. And I think just like sort of the conservatives sort of moved right. And there was just sort of the I think the Internet came along uh, and social media where people can just go out on their own. Now there's a million YouTube uh, channels. There's a million podcasts. Um, there's people with huge audiences and like, uh, you know, the establishment magazines and newspapers and TV, they sort of had to move to the right just where, where the audience was. And they're not as important as they used to be. Uh, so it's sort of hard to get canceled on the right if you want to, you know, it, it's very, very context dependent. I mean, it's like because we have Substack, uh, they're committed to free speech. And because we have Elon Musk buying Twitter, uh, that's that's all you need. Anyone can anyone can do anything um, if you can get people to follow you. If you can get people to, if you're an essayist or you're just a good good on social media, um, nobody can nobody can get rid of you. Um, and so yeah, I mean it, it's there's more freedom. Um, I think that there's like a, sort of a narrowing of debate um, within elite institutions. So American universities are particularly bad. Uh, the mainstream media is you know pr gone pretty crazy on race and gender issues. It's not, it'll never be 2020 again. Um, but it, you know, it is pretty restricted, uh, what you could talk about. So cancel culture is the, there used to, we used to talk about it in the United States as a, like, cause it was a monoculture. It was like, if the New York times said you were racist or they hit, wrote a hit piece about you, uh, like 
conservative uh, publications, all of us wouldn't want to have anything to do with you, right? So there was a cancel culture, and like the whole culture was just dependent on sort of like what a few people said, and that's gone. Now you have this right wing culture and this left wing culture, um, and like sort of you know these different flavors of different things, and people going out on their own. Uh, and so you know it depends on sort of your perspective as to whether it's getting better or or, or uh, pretty much being. I don't think it's getting worse, but probably staying the same in the uh, you know in some of the elite institutions. Well, it's interesting you mentioned twenty twenty. I think that that does feel like. Like, like it's it's hard to describe to people. Well, it will be hard to describe to people how how you couldn't say certain things at that time, uh, uh, and if you said it, like you would be eviscerated, or like it would just be you would be disappeared, completely disappeared. Um, but do you think we'll ever get to a point where it's frowned upon, like to go on a, a crusade or cancel someone? For example, there's there's. A 90-minute podcast episode out there where two hosts pour over every detail of your online life in loving detail. Like this thing is like um, just, it's like. What is this? Who, who is this? It's, you've, you, you know, you've mentioned this guy before. His name's Katz. That that guy, uh, Jonathan. He did a ninety minute podcast on me. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's 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 an episode. I'm I'm serious. Go into YouTube and just type uh, Richard Hanania. You know, maybe. And I think I did the filter maybe for this month or or something like that. And um, it they talk. I'll send you the link. Actually, they 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 talk about yeah, you. No, in, I don't, don't want to. I, I don't care about this stuff. Like I, well, I no, principle. Uh, I don't. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's not. It's not about uh, you know caring about it. It's just you know. I mean, you, 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 there's some claims made. There's some claims made about you. I mean, maybe you might want to know about that. I don't know. Um, I'm no, so- I don't want to know. <laughs> well, that's neither do I. Neither do I really. But yeah. this is out there. Is what I'm saying. Like, like the, 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 that's what I'm saying. It's a 90 minute research podcast. He's got. He's got. This thing with 73 views. Is that it? Well, I'm one of those views. So <laughs> <laughs> one of 73 people have seen it. Yeah. We're giving it more press than it does. See, now you mentioned oh, it. Now damn. it's going to have 150. No, but these guys, all these, but the beauty audience. about all these things is that they've actually driven up the sales of your book, which is nice. But, uh, but, but anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make just, is. It just demonstrates how it doesn't matter. This guy's wasting his life, right? He, he's, he's 90 minutes for 70 people. He's, you know, not even getting yeah. a person a minute for, you know, for talking about. But it. listening yeah, to crazy. it, I got, I got that feeling. It just came across as, as creepy and unhinged because it was, there was that zeal and that passion behind, you you know, talking about you like you were, yeah, like like the head of of some, um, I don't know, yeah, like Nazi organization kind of like you know, um, and I think it even sort of had mildly scary music behind it and stuff. Now I'm just wondering if we're going to get to the place where, because I mean, if I mentioned at a party that I just, oh yeah, I just done this podcast on someone and like it, gone into this detail about how I'd researched them for endlessly for days and weeks and whatever i mean that to me is just would be would be weird the people that in the i'd be talking to would be like oh that sounds hectic you know what i mean yeah i mean these people have like sort of a religious view on you know these things racism and sex and so like if i found out that you guys had like a problem with like filipinos or something Mm. like you know, I wouldn't like become motivated to find out if you're important and everything you've ever did in your life and make sure that you never had another job or like had another thing to do. I mean, I don't think in terms of like heresy, right? It's like someone could even have a bad opinion, even an evil or a stupid opinion. I don't know all your opinions. I mean, and, you know, and like, so what? I, I go on. These people, if you sort of, if you, you know, violate certain sacred taboos on race, on gender, usually on race in my case is what they're most upset about. Um, to them, that's that's more that's the definition of morality. Like that's the litmus test for whether you are a person who should be listened to or should exist in, you know, as a public person in any capacity. Um, and so, yeah, it's a sad thing. I mean, but they're, but, you know, I think that they are, the, you know, there's a, um, they are not the, you um, you know, they, they don't have the power that they once did. I mean, this cat's thing. I mean, he doesn't matter. He was complaining once. I did see, I d- didn't see his podcast, but I did see some articles people showed me where he like tried to write a New York Times op-ed about me. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like complaining that they wouldn't take it, like because the New York Times, like you know, whatever, like we're not going to have hundred articles on Richard Hanania, yeah. and he's just like, I'm publishing it here because they don't think it's important. Like they, he's like, they need to be held accountable because they published me or something like that. And, the New York and Times, so, like, you know, they just, weren't ready for what he was laying down. That's what he's saying. Yeah, yeah, they were quite covering for their own racism for associating with me or something. Um, and yeah, he published it on a Substack and like whatever. Substack is not that popular. I mean, I, I don't, I don't care. Like the, you know, they they are like the remnants of like you know 2019, 2020 culture. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and they're going to just become less powerful as time goes on, not just because of the way the culture is moving, but because of, uh, you know, just because there's more freedom of speech because of Musk having Twitter, because of Substack, because, you know, technology is going to keep progressing. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the gatekeeping function is just not there like it used to be. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm amused to hear that guy sort of did a 90 minute podcast, you know, tracing my internet <laughs> history. I mean, good for him. But, but do you think we'll get to a point in history where this sort of outrage archaeology that, that people engage in will be frowned upon, where people will just, uh, will just say that enough, stop it. Get over it, you know, get over it. Yeah, I mean, there's like a there's like a thing going on right now. So with the day we're recording this, just a few days after the Hamas attack on Israel, and you see, I see conservatives uh, sort of gloating, like, "Oh, these college kids who are like saying good things about the Hamas, you know, they're gonna they're not gonna be employable." So it's like just human nature that people are gonna like want to sort of cancel uh, people who offend them or people who they don't like. Um, it, it, so I don't know. I think that, yeah, it, you know, it'll, I think it'll probably exist somewhere just because, you know, there's powerful sort of emotional forces behind wokeness, behind political correctness. Um, you know, so it'll exist. I mean, it'll be its own sort of, you know, I think Katz has, you know, a few Substack subscribers that he has, you know, some people who listen to him. Uh, but, you know, the question, you know, everything will sort of exist in some form in the future of the Internet. Uh, the question is how important it will be. And, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that it's not going to be very important. Well, before we get into this actual substance of your of your book and so, and, and its thesis, uh, the, the, it's worth saying that the Atlantic wrote an incredible review of your book. Uh, I happen to think uh, it's a worth, worthwhile read. Your book, but um, they, in contrast, say that quote it's a racist, sexist fever dream, the product of an author who's not in considerable in- intellect has been warped and distorted like many young conservatives by obnoxious mixture of racist pseudoscience and the casual misogyny of the extremely on- online right. What do you say? You know, it's funny. I, I, I hate, you know, I just fight with the online right, like to an extreme degree. I mean, if people are on my Twitter account, they'll see this. And he sort of, you know, it's a weird article because he admits, uh, you know, I'm right. Like the main thesis of the book is, um, is you know, where wokeness came from. It's based on law. And he basically says that's a good explanation. And that's right. Uh, he's very upset because he feels I probably have, you know, and I do, uh, politically incorrect views on race and gender, even though it's not really the focus of the book, he really doesn't have, he really has to go outside the book uh, to get that stuff. Um, and so I think this is like, yeah, I, this, you know, this our gateway of white supremacy, gateway to you know, white supremacy. I mean, it was, it's good. I mean, people, you know, talk about that now when I go on other uh, podcasts and they say, isn't this funny, you know, isn't this funny, this review? I wish more, you know, I wish more liberals would sort of engage with the book. I was happy to get the Atlantic review. Um, but I, th- this is what I'm talking about. Like it, the review had to be uh, this way, right? It had to be a black guy saying this guy has politically incorrect views on race. If it was a white guy saying this is a good book and very interesting, I mean, all his, you know, all his uh, co-workers will probably uh, blast him on Twitter. I don't know. Maybe that's a little bit dated. I think it's a little bit dated because you know, nobody like sort of steps out of line anymore. So you don't have these opportunities uh, uh, for people to be scolded um, by, you know, those who are on the on the race beat. Um, the race beat. So, yeah, I mean, th- there was a there was there was a tone in it though. There's sort of a disappointed tone. This person's disappointed that yeah, you know, like you said, like yeah, you're, said. you're, you know, you're a wasted talent. You know what I mean? Like you got something, yeah. and you've blown <laughs> it. You know, just come. Well, people, the, the people can't don't know what to make of me, right? Like I have I have very like liberal articles. Like I have some of my most popular Substack are basically just saying liberals are right about this one thing and liberals share them um i don't know if they would share them anymore but they they used to um and they drew a lot of you know uh subscribers that way um but yeah they're just crazy they're just crazy on race and sex to a lesser extent but mainly on race and you know what can you do you you, <laughs> you know i want to be able to be able to talk to anybody i want people like if they like something i say and they think i make a good point that they think is interesting you know they can engage with that and then if they think i'm crazy in another area that's fine um but you know that's that's very hard to do with sort of these people with you know when they have these sacred beliefs on these sensitive issues um you know so it is what it is people will still read me and you know even though they might uh in the atlantic they might not you know openly talk about it as much as they used to well i i think the atlantic review is actually a really good uh advertisement for your book i think it'll drive sales up and it reminds me of back in the day when fight club the movie came out and the dvd cover they put all the all the bad quotes from all the reviews all over the cover and the inside of it 
Uh, and 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 I think that was an amazing. It was thing cool. It made it rock. It made it more rock <laughs> it and roll. It made it rock and roll. It yeah. did. It did for sure. Yeah, no, I've been, I've been, yeah, I've been, I've been promoting that review. I mean, it, it is, it's so, and it's so, you know, over the top. It's not like I disagree with his views. It's like a gateway to white supremacy, fever dream. <laughs> There's no fever. You guys have read this book. It's the most. <laughs> it's very, you know, it's, it's very, very measured, yeah. and it's and a very well measured, sort yes. of almost scholarly, opinionated, but like you know, like a scholarly tone. It's not talking about. <laughs> You know, it's not insulting people. It, it, it's a very sort of strange thing to say, but I just think it just demonstrates how irrational these people can be on these issues. Well, let's let's start to, to dip our toe in the water here and get into your book. Uh, your book is is interesting in that it takes a different approach to to wokeness and the origins of it than some other books we've seen. W- would you mind running us through sort of the broad thesis of of your book? Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, the idea is that basically you can trace this culture, you know, this cultural shift that we call wokeness to uh, civil rights law. So a series of laws and regulations um, and court decisions in the United States, mainly in the 60s and 70s, but, you know, in different areas also in the 80s and early 90s uh, that basically made institutions be obsessed with um, identity issues, right? So the idea that uh, if one group does better on tests, that test is presumptively ra- presumptively racist. That's from a 1971 Supreme Court case. Uh, employers have had to censor the speech of employees and censor their own speech uh, due to also this, uh, also how the Civil Rights Act has been interpreted since the 1980s. This led to HR departments. Uh, how we classify race in America can be directly traced uh, to government um, to, to government policy. Uh, and so the basic, you know, the basic idea is that like people are always looking for ideological explanations uh, for these things. And I don't think the ideological explanations are very good. I think you can trace it pretty directly um, from civil rights law uh, to the cultural shift. I show how we, I show how that happened. I go into the history behind it, uh, and I explain to people sort of what they can do about it. So that's that's pretty much the uh, the gist of the book. Well, we we're going to be using the term woke and wokeness a lot today. We've already used those terms. Do you mind giving us your definition of the term and and maybe run us through the the three central pillars of of wokeness? Yeah, so it's the idea that disparities are caused by discrimination, right? And it's it's uh you know it's whites doing better than non-whites or men doing better than women, um, past discrimination or present discrimination. Uh, you need speech codes. It's a res- speech restrictive. Uh, uh, kind of ideology that be, says you have to restrict speech in order uh, to overcome those disparities. And then you need an HR bureaucracy um, in order to sort of enforce this attempt to overcome disparities and to restrict speech, right? So, you know, I think this is, I think this is pretty much what people, when people say, you know, this is woke, you know, they're saying, you know, they're talking about like schools not disciplining students because, you know, some races uh, discipline more than the other or, um, you know, or like economic people are talking often economic inequality, right? On race, sex, love, women earning less than men, right? Or they're trying to shut someone's speech down on these issues. So I think it's, I think it pretty much captures the core of an awokeness. People can, you know, expand that and talk about climate change or something. I mean, you hear that sometimes too. But I think that I think this is sort of just like the you know the best definition that gives us some, something manageable to work with. And you know, we've read elsewhere that there was a great awakening in 2015 or so, or, you know, around that time. But your book says that the root system of this uh, way of thinking goes back further. It reminded me of a, an old. Uh, trashy horror movie called When a Stranger Calls and basically this chick is being menaced over the phone and it's revealed that the guy's actually in the house, you know, and uh, I feel like when I read your book that wokeness has been in the house uh, uh, all along. So, uh, you know, how far how far back does this thing go? So, I mean, it goes, you know, it goes back pretty far. The idea that, um, you know, racial inequality is a problem um, that it needs to be solved by government action. And there's sort of no limits on like what government can do or like the extent to which, you know, you can sort of blame it all on discrimination. Um, that is really a, like a mid 1960s, you know, late 1960s idea. I mean, it's just sort of in the immediate aftermath of the civil rights act. Um, and so there's different kinds of wokeness, like if you see, you know, different components. So if you want to talk about like gender identity stuff, you know, that's very recent. That's in the last decade or so. Um, but on, on sex and on race in particular, um, it really is the American conversation. It seems like there's been radical changes over the last, uh, you know, few years. 
um, it really is just sort of um, it really is uh, you know deja vu, right? So you can, you could can go back to the early 1990s and you you can see you know you can go back to the 60s and you can go back to 90s. You'll have a confrontation between pol- uh, police and a young black criminal. Um, you know they'll die or something will happen to them, and then there will be like race riots. Right. And then people will say, oh, it's poverty that caused this. And, you know, we need to, you know, uh, you know, we need to uh, overcome our, you know, racist past. And then conservatives will say we need law and order and, you know, you can't apologize for this stuff. This happens, you know, this happens like every almost every decade or every other decade in the U.S. since the 1960s. Um, and so, like, especially on race, sex, you know, it, it, it's it is sort of it, it does go through these waves. They're a little bit different. But, you know, on race in particular, I think people like need to see that there there really are continuities here. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we could be we could be in the same situation 30 years down the line. Like, I don't see why not. But what I love about your book is the way it focuses on law and, and bureaucracy as being at the heart of this thing. Uh, and but, but why do you, why do you think we tend to focus on the other narrative, the one that emphasizes a cabal of postmodern Marxist kink machines plotting around a table at Harvard? You know, like the, 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 this is the sort of more we've read we've read books about this where people go, oh, they go into the postmodern you know roots of this thing, and and it, the focus is on academics. But do you think that this is egocentrism? Uh, you know that we all suffer in that we sort of overstate the importance of thinkers and academics in in, in this thing. Yeah, I think I think people are lazy. I mean, to know something about the law takes a lot of sort of reading boring, uh, you know, a lot of boring material and knowing a lot about history. Right. It's so much easier to say this person thought this thing. And now everyone just, you know, Marx or Foucault is like pulling the strings and making every liberal act like the way they do. Right. Um, I, you know, I think I think it is just sort of like an intellectual laziness, um, which is why, you know, the, which is why like the, the legal or bureaucratic or institutional focus. I mean, I think I think I make a very strong case. I think the evidence is there. Um, it's not something that's sort of like, uh, you know, it's been hidden or anything. It's just like you have to read a lot of books and a lot of articles and sort of a lot of legal documents in order to put the story together. Well, I'd love to get your take on uh, the, the sort of the fairly recent Supreme Court ruling against the affirmative action admission policies of, of, of Harvard and, and the University of North Carolina, which I think uh, I think your book sort of was written and came out just just before that that ruling. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, they banned affirmative action, Supreme Court banned affirmative action in uh, in um, uh, universe, the university setting. I think that, you know, it's it's going to, and I think it's pretty much demonstrated my point, the reaction afterwards. There's a lot of uh, news stories about um, universities and co- even corporations, even though it wasn't directly related to, uh, uh, even though it wasn't directly related to uh, corporate hiring or corporate uh, business practices. Um, you know, there's already been a reaction there just in one Supreme Court case. Now, what the next step is going to be, it depends on what the next, every legal case, every decision is sort of a, uh, it just moves the needle a little bit, right? And then the next, and then the next question is sort of you know what's gonna what's gonna come next because then what's legal it's sort of there's something else on the border and then you're gonna you know you're gonna fight that and then go go to the next thing uh, so you know who, who's on the judiciary uh, who are the judges um, the way they rule in the next few years is gonna help determine this a lot but I think that the I think that the decision is like a really good sort of demonstration of my thesis I mean there there hasn't been a really a, a conservative you know uh, a major decision pushing in this direction uh, to this extent in a very, very long time, if, if ever, really, since the, uh, so since the Civil Rights Act was passed. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's important. It's importance that will be determined by sort of what comes after. But even California doesn't like affirmative action. I mean, that, that is saying a lot. If California isn't into this idea... Uh, well, they are, they sort of are. I mean, they, 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 you know, they, they, they get around it like the voters are not, but like... You know, they get around at institutions like the University of California system does practice some affirmative action. Uh, and so, yeah, elites, you know, American elites just they do love this stuff. I mean, they are sort of they are sort of guilty. I mean, they do it like Oscars, like for the Oscars and stuff like that. Like they just feel guilty. They just feel like, ew, everything is too white. <laughs> like something has to be done about this. Uh, it is sort of, you know, organic, not maybe among the masses of the people, but at least among sort of uh, artistic and sort of 
government and educational elites. We we'll love it. We, 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 you know, we, we love uh, affirmative action so much. We're going to sit in an audience and watch a man get up and slap another man on stage <laughs> in front of the world, and everyone will just sit there politely and go, "We are. We don't know what to do in this situation." Is that, is that because of affirmative action? I don't know. <laughs> that, well, no, they were too frightened. The security were too yes. frightened. Everyone was too frightened. They were like, "What do yes. we do?" Like maybe. Well, the could've... security guards were probably white. You know, imagine that Ma- white security guards it, coming look, on. I don't know. know what happened. It could have been because he's Will Smith. It could have been because it's it, it's Hollywood and it's famous. But it didn't look good on the on the, on the outset. It looked like I mean, you know. I, uh, w- you know, would we let Jack Nicholson? Maybe we would. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but but one of the tensions you bring he up. Slap the white man. That would have been funny. I mean, that would have been funny. That would have been probably more affirmative action. It was a black guy slapping a black guy. Yeah, it was maybe they, they would have been. I don't know. I think if it was like a rapper. Yeah, I think it was also, if it was like a dangerous rapper. I don't even know who rap, who's a dangerous rapper anymore. 50 Cent. I don't know. That's a dated, a dated reference. You have maybe. just dated yourself. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you, you're on my page, though. Well, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, I think I mean he's still out there. If he went instead of Will Smith, I think they probably would have they probably would have sent some danger. Will yes, Smith, probably. So. But but in your book, you talk about this this uh, this interesting tension between uh, the the in the in the U.S. There's there's this sort of desire for um, you know helping out um, uh, p- people who uh, it's perceived need help. You know, minorities and people who are disadvantaged. But then there's this absolute horror of of quotas. So we've got this tension between, because part of me, when I was reading your book, I was like, oh, geez, wouldn't it just be, it'd just be so much cleaner if they, if, if they just, if people just said, yeah, we want a quota, we want a quota. Yeah. It's, it's the, the subterfuge and the, and the, the going along to get along and the bureaucracy and, and, and the circuitous route to get to this quota, uh, which is so frustrating. Yeah. I mean, it's not, this is not the left's fault, actually. It's just a political compromise, right? Because um you know like people on the farthest left want the quotas and the people on the right don't want quotas and it's the people in the middle who've been sort of you know having the court decisions that have come down that have like made this sort of in-between system where you can use race but you really can't use race or something and like you can have disparate impact and all these other things uh so yeah i mean i think that you know it's, it's an interesting question you know sort of uh what would have happened if we just you know allowed quotas like i you know i don't know like what would have happened to the culture it would have it would have been um it would have been interesting. I mean, we would have gone in a different direction. It's completely plausible that this would have caused a backlash, and then we would have gone to straight uh, race blindness, right? Because this was uh, this was an issue um, in American politics. Sort of disappeared by around you know 2000 or so. But like in the 1990s and 1980s, like politicians would talk about uh, quotas more, although it was sort of always sort of hidden. But if it was explicit that whole time. Um, you know, politicians might have, you know, between Reagan and, and Bush and that era, uh, they might have done something about it. Um, or maybe, you know, who knows, maybe it would have just created, you know, maybe it just, well, you know, I mean, like, it's, these things are hard to get rid of. They often, you know, it's rare that we get rid of quotas. Maybe the American system is different. It's just so contrary to, uh, you know, American sort of political culture. But yeah, maybe it would have just created a radical base of sort of activists within organizations, and things would have made the same, been the same, or even even worse. It's hard to know, but I, you know, it's, it certainly would have been different. I mean, it would have been a sort of fast. It would be fascinating if we could run that experiment. Mm. Well, you write that, that that businesses are required to get results, but aren't allowed to use quotas, which is as as John said, it's like this weird subterfuge. You know, yeah. are are quotas illegal? Like, if they if they were to say, you know, th- you need to have this many people, is that illegal? Yeah. Yes, it's illegal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, technically, everyone agrees. All the Supreme Court cases say that's illegal. Now, what you have is what you what you have to have is disparate affirmative action, which is goals and timetables. Uh, which means that if you don't have enough women or minorities, you set a goal. Um, and you know, this, this sounds stupid, um, but it basically, it, you know, it is just sort of. A thing of semantics it can't be too explicit um but if your numbers don't line up the government will come after you in various ways uh so you can see sort of how like everything is sort of has to be this sort of has this split personality uh within every american institution um they're suing some of the like these law firms and stuff over like quotas which are not like quotas but like explicit like programs this only goes to women of color or something and the you know the now that they're being sort of challenged legally the um, the you know the corporations are just getting rid of those programs they you know they know they can't even be defended uh, in court uh, but you know even despite the supreme court decision the, the rest of the regime the disparate impact the affirmative action and contracting all of that it still stands and we're still in sort of the same position but hopefully moving in the right direction 
Well, m- maybe you could tell us how the government actually in- enforces this, because they they wouldn't do it openly with sort of fines, would they, if, if they don't meet these timetables or these these goals, as you say. Yeah. Well, a lot of American, I mean, this is part of an, a, a larger story that I talk about in the book, where a lot of American law is outsourced uh, to the legal system. So lawyer, uh, lawyers uh, basically look for, quote unquote, discrimination. Uh, usually they go for the corporations with the deepest pockets uh, and they threaten them or they sue them. And that's how a lot of a lot of it happens. A huge portion, like 10, 15, 20 percent, depending on the year of federal lawsuits in the U.S. are civil rights lawsuits. So civil rights lawsuits is just a huge portion, probably the number one thing. And so it doesn't require government to do anything except uh, preside over the cases. Um, you have then you have also affirmative action and government contracting. You will have like these EEOC, uh, Department of Justice, you know, sort of investigations uh, into companies like they're going after, you know, Elon Musk now for, uh, you know, discriminating against refugees or something at SpaceX. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it has sort of various ways to come at you. But the legal system, like the private legal, you know, private lawsuits are pretty much the main way they do it. And and you also seem to to, to, to suggest in your book that corporations could actually fight back against some of this stuff, but they don't. Why is this? Yeah, I mean, I think like it's not a good. I don't know. They they could have. They can. You know, the incentive structure is shaped by the judiciary. So in previous decades, probably was much harder. They would just probably lose lawsuits. Uh, Now they can. I mean, I think it's just everything is sort of in flux because you have the media completely you know, obsessed with sort of woke on race and gender issues. And then you had the, for the long time, you had government bureaucrats. So the government bureaucrats are still who they are. Uh, but then the judiciary was also controlled by the uh, uh, by liberals or at least liberals on racial issues. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're in flux. I think we're I think we're seeing sort of conservative boycotts succeed. I think we're seeing corporate America turning more towards a less, um, you know, a less aggressive sort of more neutral uh, political line. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, you know, they just want to, they just want their lives to be, they just want their lives to be, uh, as easy as possible. Right. They're not there, but most of the, you know, I think that people made a mistake. Like I think around 2020, a lot of, or even earlier, a lot of conservatives were being really stupid. I mean, they seem to believe that like corporations had made it their mission, uh, to discriminate against whites and, you know, push, you know, Marxist ideas. And that was never the case. I mean, they were, they were sometimes captured by sort of HR and DEI, or they were pressured by the media, or they were uh, complying with legal requirements or what they thought legal requirements were, or sort of like implicit threats from politicians. Uh, but I've always thought that the, uh, uh, woke capital thing was sort of a red herring that once you uh, push back just a little bit, you change the incentives, the behaviors of corporations would change too. Well, you, you tell a great story in the book about, uh, I believe it's a, a black man and his son. I think they work at a Tesla factory. Is that, is that yeah. right? Where, yeah, yeah. Uh, where he claimed to be uh, racially discriminated against because people in the workforce were using uh, racial slurs there. And I assume they were using the N-word. No, they uh, were Latino. Also say, there was Diaz. Oh, were they? It was oh, okay. The two Diaz. Yeah, yeah oh, they, they were, that's they right. were, they were right. mostly or all black as far as I can tell. Or black or Hispanic. Right, yeah. yes. Well, he, he successfully sued the company for uh, just people in the workplace using a racial slur. And, and the, the, the workforce, the people that were doing it were actually, they actually came clean and said they were doing it sort of in, in, in jest as, you know, they were, they were doing it as, as like more of like a, a joke, I guess. I don't know how that works. But still, yeah. this guy managed to take what, what, what is, you know, it's not a great thing, but, but it's, it's not worth the. I, I mean, how much money did he get? Hundreds of thousands of dollars or something for this? It, well, no, he won. He won first a hundred million, something like that, in the jury trial, and then the judge reduced it to I think ten million or something, like five or ten million. So, so it was something ridiculous. I think it's still in court. I don't know if he got the money yet, but yeah, it was more than hundreds of thousands. It was. But still, the the payout doesn't really match the you know the the the, the, yeah, um, yeah. the thing that the, the thing that happens. So, do you think those sorts of cases are going to blow this this thing up and? and and stop it because i mean people are going to take advantage of this aren't they yeah they do i mean it's it's you know they have there's punitive damages right so you don't have to even it's not you get money back from what you owed or something for being discriminated against uh you potentially you know depending on the exact kind of lawsuit and where you are uh can you can uh have punitive damages that are capped in some cases but in this particular case um was not um, for complicated legal reasons, people can read about in the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this creates you know you, like like you know are you gonna you'd be crazy to let your employees just 
joke around, you know, when you can have one guy get offended and have like tens of millions of dollars have to pay out. Of course, like corporate America is going to become sort of skittish and say, don't say anything that could offend uh, anyone. Right. It's very easy to see. And people just see the surface level. They say, oh, this is something that, you know, changed, uh, you know, like the corporations are acting this way. They're acting this way for a reason. And sort of just when you go into the law, that reason, the reasons become clear. And do you think that the the vagueness of civil rights law, uh, you know, contributes to this this situation? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you give people a list of what words they can say or not, I mean, that would be easier if you told them how many blacks they had to hire or like how many they could fire or what exactly they had to pay them relative to whites. But nobody ever knows. There's there's no like, ex, you know, there's nothing as exact here. It's all sort of just vague standard. The government can come and sort of, you know, sort of needle you a bit. You have to avoid bad press, of course, because if the press, you know, sort of says you're the racist or you're the sexist company, um, they're going to, you know, they're going to, the regulators and the trial lawyers are going to come after you. You know, uh, Musk is being sued for firing a bunch of employees. I guess they he allegedly fired uh, too many women or too, uh, too many minorities. I'm, I'm not sure exactly which or both um, when he took over Twitter. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, this is like this just creates an environment of like you have to avoid the government regulators. You have to avoid uh, bad press if you want to go on with your life. So this stuff comes from law. It can be changed by law. That's what I'm trying to you know, tell people. Um, you can go in another direction. And, yeah, I, I'm just trying to sort of let Americans sort of understand, just trying to focus them in the right direction. Don't you think this this is so uh, this is taking uh, using your book as a springboard, this next idea. But. I just because reading it and hearing about these ludicrous situations, like you just said, it's so anti creativity, anti productivity, anti innovation to be just this disgusting grifter or someone caught up in a grift where you're just like, 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 I think I can be personal about Mr. Diaz, who was offended at the racial slurs and say, you know, he's not creating anything. He's not producing anything now. Yeah. Well, maybe he might, he might look, maybe we'll take that 15 mil and then he'll finally have the time to create something. But like, it's, it's, it's just one of those things. Like it's so crushing to read, to, 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 to think about this, this whole system being um, not about driving us forward it's a it's holding us back yeah i mean it's a um you know it's 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 all over our it's all over the economy right i mean you sort of have people who produce things and then you have like rent seekers like you know grabbing a toll each way right you know hire enough minorities like pay out this lawsuit for this you know thing uh just sort of like uh you know what they've done to sort of uh spacex when like these government bureaucrats are you know making sure they don't like you know disturb any you know disturb any crabs or whatever there was some like ridiculous thing about spacex wanted a rocket launch and they said some quail eggs you know uh, and some windows were broken i mean it's just so uh, and so these government regulators are like sort of you know every everywhere um, and this is, yeah, this is, this is not a complicated sort of, this is not a new critique of society. This is standard conservative libertarian uh, sort of argument of people who create stuff and then sort of this activist, bureaucratic and legal class that just sort of, you know, rent seeks and, you know, and uh, stops other people from being able to do things. So, yeah, you're right. Civil rights law should be sort of understood in that context. Well, in addition to this whole thing affecting hiring practices, you do say in your book that the government regulates dating and humor in the workplace can yeah. can, can you can you run us through how they actually do this and 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 what the impact of this regulation is on your average worker and 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 employer yeah so the uh, so yeah there you know there is a, like a, you know the civil rights act said don't discriminate based on race don't discriminate on sex that kid became interpreted decades later to say don't um create a hostile environment now hostile environment to here we're talking about sex uh basically can be unwanted attention from males towards females and it doesn't even have to be that you know like you know the regulators have said that it can be you know uh sexually charged jokes or like, you know, using, uh, you saying foreman instead of... But what about this? Foreman. What about, so Ricky is my co-worker. He bends down to get something from the copier and I pull out a slide whistle and I go, what? Like, like, you know, when he bends down, is that enough? <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's probably not a by itself, but, you know, it would be go, it would go into the file. I mean, they would make a case. <laughs> uh, it's in yeah, the file, exactly. John. It's in the file. So imagine a big corporation where you have not just you two guys, but 50 people. What are you going to tell them? 
you could make a joke, but if that guy doesn't make a joke, all you can do is say nobody make a joke because you can't, you don't under, you don't know like what everyone else uh, is going to be doing. Um, and so, yeah, you could see you could see there's a guy named Eugene Volokh, a law professor, who's sort of written about how this inevitably leads to sort of zero tolerance. You can see this directly. You can see the rise of this in the 1990s. I mean, they made uh, sexual harassment suits more expensive in the 19, uh, 1990s. Um, and then, like, you see the number of, uh, you know, complaints and uh, lawsuits and then some big news stories, you know, really take off during that time period. So, yeah, you can trace it pretty directly. Uh, you can trace it pretty directly to changes in the law. So how are people meant to hook up then? If we can't, you know, like, you know, if this, if this, if this is, go, I mean, let's face it. I mean, most of us meet at work. It's a good vetting system for, you know, um, uh, your partner. Is this, is this now eventually going to be fully litigated out of, of society? No, I mean, it, I mean, to an extent, yeah, but I mean, a lot of people still do meet their spouses at work. It's not actually illegal to date your coworker. I mean, it can be probably, you know, it's not actually illegal. Some places might have policies, but usually, you know, they let they understand that it happens. And you know, maybe a boss and an employee, um, you know, is probably more more commonly considered problematic. Although, I mean, like you know, women some often like you know a man sort of in position of authority and power, and so if that mm. becomes more difficult. Yeah. sort of you can see how that could interfere with uh relationships so yeah i mean people are going to the internet or people are not having uh as many relationships anymore i i don't know if the, how much of this can be traced to civil rights law but you know perhaps some of it because well, we've really got to flirt to get the don't we like the, the initial stages yeah. like yeah. because because it's not just the would you like to da- go out on a date it's all the stuff before that it's the sub rosa stuff yeah exa- exactly it's the environment it's a sexually charged environment yes um it still happens though, right? It's it's not like, I don't know, you never worked in America, but there's still like, you know, there's still people will be, you know, men will be men and they'll, you know, hit on women will be women too. And, you know, they'll hit on each other and they'll hook up. So it'll still happen. Um, it happens a lot, but you're right. Probably in the more white collar sort of, uh, uh, you know, upper class sort of workplace, it's probably more difficult um, than, you know, I've worked with a lot of like blue collar. They're like the guys who are in the warehouse with Diaz and, and Diaz and his son Diaz. I mean, they were, you know, they don't care, right? And then they end up getting, you know, Elon Musk in trouble. Uh, you know, it's just ridiculous, this sort of ridiculous system. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we should take seriously, like the impact on sort of dating and marriage and, you know, uh, you know, creating families. Uh, this is a huge social cost, even if it's, even if it's little, even if it's like a few marriages are being stopped and few families are being formed, it's a huge, you know, social cost for what? So government could tell us, you know, what jokes we can make. It's, it's, it's terrible. Maybe it'll make that office flirting more dangerous and more exciting because you've got to sort of, you know, you've got to That's, do it. Yeah, that is true. Like, quiet. yeah, I was, I, was really, I was seeing some kids, like young men these days, like, oh, it's weirder to approach women than it used to be in public. But it just makes you sort you just stand out now more, right? If, if you do it well, you know, you're going to, a woman, like you hear women all the time complaining, no man, you know, <laughs> is trying to hit on me. So like, yeah, it's maybe a little weirder, but it's also like, it's an opportunity if no one else is doing it too. So yeah, there's that. Things These things can sometimes balance oh. so, so that can be your market differential that you're you're the one willing to take that first step I like yeah it. i mean if every man is like a wimp then like you're you stand i mean it's easier to be you know easier to be attractive to women i mean i think that i should write i should write more about this every time i write about dating or something <laughs> it goes viral and i get like a million uh views on, on twitter um we count my views now not even retweets or likes the view counter i think has taken over uh but yeah <laughs> there's uh yeah there's um we're off topic here, but it's an important topic. <laughs> maybe that'll be maybe that'll be my next book. Yeah, yeah, you have to write a dating book next. Um, so I I wanted to ask you, you know, how does religion factor into all of this? You know, is is anyone concerned that there's not a balanced proportion of Catholics, Hindus, and Muslims in the workplace? Now I know this is a tongue in cheek question, but I, I am interested in how diversity and equity bureaucrats and and the you know the diversity obsessed elites treat discrimination when it's on the basis of religion um that you know they, well you, ha- you you don't have disparate impact you don't have the statistical you didn't hire enough catholics or you hired too much Protestants because we don't keep the data on race you have to keep the data right and so this is sort of a, a path dependency now if it turns out that you are like hostile to catholics or jews or something you can still be sued under the civil rights laws um but you know it's like getting rid of like the data collection and the disparate impact and the statistical measures of discrimination takes care of like 70 percent of the problem um and because you know there's nothing there's nothing to obsess over you don't collect the data how can you have a program to you know have more jews or have more catholics you just can't 
Well, I'd like to see a program where where they perhaps hire more people without university degrees. I think that would be that'd be a good thing to happen. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I'd like less fewer people to get university degrees. Now there's sort of an adverse selection thing where like people who don't get university degrees often are, uh, you know, they don't for because there so many people get degrees now. But like if you don't, it's sort of a bad signal. Uh, so yeah, I want fewer people to go out of college. I mean, and then you know, let businesses decide sort of what makes the best employees. So it occurred to me also reading your book that I think human resources might be one of the most odious professions in the world. Who, Richard, who are these people? Help me understand the enemy. I mean, there's, you know, there's Hamas kidnappers out there. And there oh, they're are, pretty bad too. Uh, Sorry. North Korean, you know, gulag. Oh, yeah, they're uh, bad know, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they're 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 just they're over they're disproportionately women. Um, you know, they I think it's like you know, two to one or something uh, close to that. And some of them I think do normal like human like uh, paperwork for hiring and firing. I think I don't think why HR do women like well. if if it is true that women uh, overrepresent in this category? Why do they love it? Why do they love it so much? Women I think go into like white collar things that are not too ambitious and don't require a lot of hard work. I mean I think that's very common. Like secretarial work I think used to be uh, all women, but now is still like mostly women. Uh, so I think anything sort of paperwork and you know not you know just sort of iffy having to do with people. Uh, I think you find women, and then yeah, it is a sort of a woke sort of bureaucracy um, to a large extent. Um, and so yeah, that makes sense. It would draw more women too. And so yeah, what these people do is, I mean, they I don't know, you have a, like HR. Does the phrase like means it means the same thing? In yes, Australia? you never yes, want to hear it. You never want to hear yeah. it. HR. I've informed it's HR. Amazing, it's amazing to use the same words. I mean, it was like an American thing that popped up, and somehow it's also in Australia and other countries uh, too. I can't um, imagine what so, people did before it. Actually, like did like it's like someone just did something, and everyone was like, "I'm going to tell." Uh, I don't know who I'm going to tell. I just have to get well, on with my work. Wouldn't you tell the boss or your site manager or like the next I mean, person you, up? Like, either, yeah, you either dealt with it yourself. I mean, you just you were like an adult, right? You deal with it yourself or <laughs> you find a new job or you just tell your – maybe you tell your boss. There, It became formula, formalized. The entire workforce, the entire workplace became formalized starting in like the 60s and 70s. And that includes everything. That includes record keeping. Like used to be promotions. Like there were – it was like not so common to have an evaluation – where like, you know, you would sit there and you'd say X, you know, you did X, Y, Z. It used to be sort of more informal, like the boss sort of or the manager sort of knew who was a good employee, uh, who wasn't, and they could promote and hire and fire on that basis. But you can't do anything informally anymore uh, because you you need to defend yourself. You need a paper trail to show you're not being racist. So you want to fire a black guy. You got to be able to say, oh, you know, you didn't do, you know, you didn't make this many calls or you didn't make this many sales this month. You know, if you just sort of go off the top of your head, you know, there's a problem, there's a potential discrimination lawsuit or case made for discrimination. Uh, so yeah, this has been like a formalization and a bureaucratization of life. It hasn't, it hasn't, it's just sort of uh, stuck to sort of race and gender, which are huge issues, right? Or how races interact and how men and women interact. Um, but it hasn't even just been that. It's sort of changed the entirety of like what work, what work means um, in the Western world. Well, Richard, we're mindful of time, so we have to start our descent here. But. Uh... We'd like to know how we wind this back. Is it even possible? Have we gone too far? It's going to be a long process. I mean, the culture has changed in certain ways. So cultural change doesn't happen overnight. Legal change can happen right away. Uh, yeah, but there's, uh, you know, there's an entire chapter of the book, uh, chapter six, which goes into exactly what court cases, uh, what sort of, of what uh, mechanisms are available to the executive branch. It's an explicitly political book. I mean, it tells you sort of what you have to do because, you know, I want to explain this stuff, but I also really hate this stuff and I want to see it change. And I'm just sort of, you know, go to chapter six. I mean, this is very American focused, but if you're any, if you have anything to do with American politics, I mean, it tells you exactly, you know, where to go. Now, some of our listeners are in normal jobs in some of them in pretty woke professions uh, and workplaces What's your advice to them, if you, if you don't mind giving some advice to someone who's been through, uh, you know, uh, some pretty heavy cancellations after just speaking your mind? Um, uh, should these should our people uh, toe the line? Should they speak out against the mad policies they don't believe in? What, what, what's your recommendation? In every every person is in a different situation. Some people, you know, don't like conflict. Some people don't mind it. Some people really feel the need to speak their mind. Other people don't i mean some people might feel pressured it depends on your work for your workplace it depends on sort of the industry you're in it's hard to give general uh advice on these things you know i i'm all, you know i'm a broadly more philosophically um i have an article called how i overcame anxiety where i think that most people in modern life are um 
pathologically uh, pathologically risk averse. So I think in like if you like we just talked about dating, if you're like on the fence of whether you should you know approach a woman or on the fence over whether you should give your opinion or not, most of the time you're worried too much and you'll live a much better and freer life if you just take you know take the step, um, you know do what you sort of want to do but are a little bit scared to do because we evolved in situations where you know the downside of risk was so large you you pissed off the uh, the tribe you know they'd stone you to death or leave you to starve that doesn't happen anymore we've evolved in this way where we think you know we're, we're going to die if like you know we look bad in a social situation or something like that um so yeah i mean i'm, I'm pro courage uh for the most part although circumstances of course uh, you know circumstances of people differ well just quickly we, we have to get your prediction on the u.s election next year how do you think it plays out uh, i think it's uh, i've always said it's going to be biden and trump more people are coming along to that uh uh, coming along to that conclusion, I think the Republicans are always sort of the um, underdog. So I think it's like 60, 40 Democrats. I think the foreign policy sort of chaos helps Republicans. Um, but yeah, it's going to be it's going to be Biden. It's going to be Trump and it's going to be a close election. I don't think one side is going to run away with it. Well, uh, one of the questions we ask all of our guests, we'd love to know what you're reading right now. Uh, what am I reading? I'm reading, uh, so there's a guy, a guy named uh, Constantine Amru. Um, have you heard of this guy? No. He sometimes goes under a Bronze Age pervert. Oh. Um, he's got a new book out. He just published his uh, dissertation, um, uh, you know, which was, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago or something or five or 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I want to write a review of that. It's, it's called, uh, uh, the, let me see, I have it on my Kindle right here. It's uh, it's selective breeding and the birth of philosophy. Uh, so it argues that basically uh, the entire like the, the ancient Greeks were interested in sort of breeding a better kind of man. This got lost um, and sort of you know was sort of ignored for most of you know history up until now. And we sort of like it's going back to the ancients and saying this is where history came from. Uh, this is where philosophy sort of how it started. I'm writing a book called Robert by Robert Gordon called The Rise and Fall uh, of American Growth. Um, it's basically, it's in the canon of sort of progress studies people. So it just shows, it just traces sort of, uh, how American, um, uh, how American living standard, uh, has risen, uh, over the last, you know, 200 years or so, not, not really 200 years. Yeah. 200 years. Yeah. Since the, since the 19th century, at least, uh, I'm reading, uh, Camille, uh, Paglia's it's an old book, uh, sexual, uh, persona. Okay. Um, yes, yeah. it's, uh, it's good. I might have some things to write about that, uh, too. Um, I just finished the Oppenheimer uh, uh, biography, American Prometheus, because so, I, I saw the book and I liked the book. Um, I wrote a review of it. Um, and then on my Twitter for just for subscribers, I wrote a review of the uh, um, of the uh, of the book that the movie was based on. So people could check that out if they're interested. You might be one of the first people uh, to, to proudly mention your Kindle. Can I, can you hold your Kindle up, please? Can I see what, what you? Oh, I have my. It's just my iPhone. It's not a. It's not. A, it's a Kindle app on the iPhone. It's not. So it's this, not the but this is fascinating because normally people go, "Let me just get the book," and they've all got these big, big books. And... I got my. Yeah. I got my. Own, I got my own book. I mean, but no, I. Uh, <laughs> no, I just read on. I just read on Kindle. I mean, it's it's my phone. I take it places. I lose stuff. Everything is clutter. Like no, I wanna. I want just. I want everything electronic. I'll lose it. The pages will get bent. I, I won't be able to find it. I, this is just much easier. I can go to the dentist or whatever. You know, sit in the waiting room and read whatever I want. Well, that's great. Well, your book is called The Origins of Woke: Civil Rights Law, Corporate America, and the Triumph of Identity Politics. It's out everywhere. It's on audio as well, which is the way uh, I read the book or listen to the book. Now, if, if people want to follow you, are you on social media? Are you on X? <laughs> no, never. I've never been on social media, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on Substack and Twitter. I'm there all day. Uh, Richard Hanadia, easy to find uh, under my old, old name. On both of them. Excellent. Well, everyone go and follow this man. Richard, it's been a pleasure and um, I don't care what The Atlantic says about you. Uh, I like the book and I thought you were a, a nice guy. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great to be here, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Richard.
Thank you for listening to the New Flesh podcast. If you like our work, please consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or even writing us a review. It really does help the show reach a wider audience. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, long live the New Flesh.